Good evening, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us. Uh, tonight's event, Work Life Balance, no, scratch that, Integration, uh, is featuring favorite ladies of mine, and I'm becoming friends with someone else. So we've got Joy Wright, class of 95, Annette Fernandez, class of 96, Beth Galvin, class of 88, to have this amazing conversation, this very important conversation, which is probably why you have joined us this evening. So thank you again. I am Yarel Silverio Marshall, class of 96, and I am Trinity WLC Programming Chair. Now, if you like these events, if you have any ideas, I'm gonna put a plug in. I could really use some help on my committee. So please reach out to myself or Melissa and let us know, you know how you wanna get involved. Um, and as you can see, Melissa Bronzina Reagan, who is class of 87 and my partner in crime, she is logged in with us. She's the Associate Director of Alumni Relations and she works behind the scenes. She's what makes us work perfectly. And if you have any questions about the Women's Leadership Council and how to get involved after tonight, please feel free to contact her. I need help. I need fresh ideas. I can only do so much. So between Melissa and myself, we could use any help that we could get. Just my little plug in case you didn't hear that. Okay. Before we get started, here's just a few housekeeping notes. Um, this third part of the Women in Work series will be recorded. And the first two programs, which was the Great Resignation and How to Navigate Through Professional Transitions, is now available in the archive on Trinity's website. Your feedback is important to us. So you'll receive a post-event email from Melissa tomorrow, tomorrow afternoon, that includes a survey. Please take a few minutes to let us know what you thought of tonight's conversation, as well as any other topics that you would like to see in the future. We have a lot on the calendar, but it, we do it because of the needs that you demonstrate to us. Um, our hope for tonight's program is that it's going to be a conversation. Beth, Joy, and Annette would welcome your participation. And if you see on your screen, you should have a Q&A and a chat. In the chat, as you hear us speak, please add you know, your comments, your encouragement, things like that. And if you have any questions that you specifically want um, answered, please add that to the Q&A button and I will make sure that we incorporate it into our conversation. Um, so there, let's see, am I forgetting anything? No, I don't think so. Other than getting started with this event, Joy, Annette and Beth come with different experiences and perspective. And so that is the beauty of this combination. And I hope that something will resonate with each and every one of you. Uh, we're going to start with a little bit of their background and why this topic resonates with them. Beth, would you like to get us started? Yes, th thank you. Um, first of all, good evening, everybody. I'm actually really excited about this topic, and um, I'm actually flattered to be on a panel with these women, with Joy and Annette and Yarell, and um, I think it's going to be a fun conversation. Do please ask questions, and and um, it is meant to be, uh, as Yarell said, casual. And we're hopefully you're going to see <laughs> how we help you to make it that way. Um, so I am class of '88. Just really, really briefly, I was an econ major. I um, fully embraced everything Trinity had to offer, and I'm sort of a passionate Trinity grad. I. Um, I did sports, I did internships, I studied abroad, I worked on campus, and um, I wanted to have an international career, and then I went and had an international career. I went, um, I did grad school overseas, and then worked overseas uh, for five years, and then came back 
and started my career with Ernst & Young um, where I worked in international tax for 26 years. Now, I'm part of the panel that is not actually um, part formally of the Great Resignation, but I just achieved um, an exciting and kind of lifelong goal, which was to wrap up my corporate career a little young while I still um, have time to do other things and while my son is still at home. So I, um, yeah, I guess I just retired about six months ago. So I have a kind of different perspective. Um, yeah. <laughs> and we'll talk about that. But through my, you know, I guess 30 something years, I saw a lot of change going on in the workplace and cer certainly experienced a lot of it. And um, I was fortunate enough to work for a company that was very progressive and was very uh, flexible for the work environment. And I guess what I'm going to share is sort of my perspective and thoughts at this point in time, because I'm actually maybe strangely, but excited about this point in history, you know, let's hopefully say post pandemic. And with this change in, in really it's a shift in worker paradigm that I think is actually as hard as, as it has been on women and so many people, I think the inverse is it's going to present and is presenting an interesting accelerant and opportunity to change how we all work. And um, so that's kind of what I wanted to to bring to the discussion today. So just to kick off some of my thoughts about work-life integration, we were very intentional in the invitation about the cross out of work-life balance. We crossed out balance and put integration. And I wanna talk about that for a minute and sort of set up the discussion here. For the first half of my career, we would talk about work-life balance and we would try to achieve it and we would, um, you know, really just sort of try to embrace that concept. And for me personally, I felt like it was this ultimate perfection that we were all supposed to strive for and that life and work were supposed to perfectly be in balance. And there was this thing that everybody else must be figuring out and I just somehow wasn't getting there. And then probably 10 years ago, the concept, at least in my field, the concept of work-life integration um, entered you know, entered the world of business and we started talking about it differently. And I think what I have learned and there's now names for are what I used to call, and it was just my nomenclature was, um, I would say I want a separation of church and state between work and home. And I was very rigid. I was probably too rigid. And I would just try and have geographic differences, time differences, like trying to box in what was work and what was my personal life. And I've now learned there's a term for that. It's called a segmenter. People at work take two approaches, segmenting or integrating. And when I, so halfway through my career, I was single for the first half of my career. And when I finally had figured that out, I went and got married and had my son. And that just, kind of changed everything. And that is when I personally learned to embrace integration of work life. And we're in this environment where because of remote work, we've all sort of been forced to, um, to integrate more than we may want for some of us in great ways. Um, and I think what it's doing is it's presenting an opportunity, a challenge, but also an opportunity to think about setting boundaries and setting priorities differently. And I just think it's it's a really great time to to embrace it. Um, I guess the only other thoughts I would add to that are I I do think that um, some people are already really good at it and we're really good at integrating before the pandemic happened. Others have been sort of pushed into the situation because of the environment. And there's sort of three factors. It's where are we working? When are we working? So what's our time boxing around how we work and how are we working? And so while everyone's still figuring out, companies, organizations are figuring out the where, and that's, in my opinion, going to evolve and it'll be different depending on where you work and what you do. I think there is the opportunity for all of us to figure out how we work and do we wanna work the how differently than we did before and when we work. So setting up boundaries around when we work, if we're working from home, 
and knowing that we have to turn the computer off, turn the phone off and, you know, separate in our own way between work and home. So those are just um, some of the thoughts that I had just to start us off. And I think I'll share, I'll share other experiences as we go along. So um, next, I think I'm handing to Joy to, to go ahead. Thanks, Beth. Um, my name is Joy Wright, class of 95. Woo -woo. Um, and when I was at Trinity, I just got major wise, I was an American studies major who decided I'm gonna be a teacher. <laughs> Um, but usually later. So I didn't do uh, St. Joe's. I ended up getting my master's in Rhode Island and then came back to teach. So I've been teaching uh, educator for 20 some odd years. And the last like 10 of those or a little more than that, I've been an administrator. Um, and so being a leader of a building, I like right now for the last going into nine years, I have, you know, 800 and some odd students and about 130 staff members. And so this piece of um, balance initially, there is none. Uh, the biggest question I get all the time from my staff, from parents, I don't know how you do it. How do you do it? And I was like, I don't know how I do it either. Um, but uh, some of that's not true. I have, a, you know, a great support system has been helpful. Um, and so you kind of rely on what that looks like to have that support system to, to help you kind of juggle what's necessary. But I think my piece with this is not only personally how I'm trying to navigate this um, as my kids get older, as I think about what I want to do, but as a leader, it's how do I, because it, it is a nonprofit, I feel like that's the struggle. Sometimes we don't, the non, nonprofits have this compassion fatigue, right? We feel called to the work, called to do it. It's, you know, mission purposeful driven. And so then we just pour everything out. And sometimes we don't even know our own boundaries or situations seem so dire, right? That we do that. And so I've, I'm struggling with how to still have compassion and empathy, but be very clear about boundaries that don't impact my family, my ability to connect with others. Um, and as a leader, try to do that for my staff, right? Not just model it, but integrate that within the workday. Like one of our, we have these big rocks. And so one of them is staff wellness. And so we talk about not just your professional growth, but your personal wellness. And um, the reality is I, can't, I can talk about that all I want, but if I don't figure out ways to embed that within the context of the workday, um, then it means nothing. And so my piece about integration is making sure I know, my staff know that we are more than just the kind of people in the suit, so to speak, that we are the people. And what do we look at that? I don't know if anyone is watching that probably already saw it, don't tell me anything because I'm just like almost to the last episode, severance um, on Apple. And it's like, they, you're, there's a severance that happens. They sever a part of the brain so that you, when, you, when you go home, you're just focused on your home self and you don't think about work. You have no work memories. And then when you come to work, you get on this elevator, it switches and you have no, like you're just at work. And, you know, it's so interesting because there's this thing, it's like, yes, I can segment <laughs> these pieces and not have to worry about it. But there is this thing of, we are the whole, we have to bring the whole as part of that. We have to integrate what that looks like in order to really be authentic, right? And um, to build the kind of communities that we want to, whatever our work community looks like. And so I, you know, I work in a school system with very traditional schedules. So there's no sense of like working from home um, outside of the pandemic. You know, once we could get back in, we got back in. So the, you know, I'm wondering how do I um, help staff do that when we have a very clear day? So one of the things is, is, you know, how I look at time when they need time, right? And, um, you know, providing opportunities for them to be able to go see their kids stuff and not have to take all their, you know, collected time to do that if they just need an hour out or something like that. I don't send emails after a certain time. I schedule them so that they're not binging at seven or eight o'clock at night, right? And so I, I, I can tell them to turn off their notifications 
But if I'm the leader sending them past those notes, right? Because most of them are their type A people. They don't do what you tell them to do because they're like good, like they're like the type A students. So then I work on making sure that I reinforce that by not creating a situation where they have to worry about how to do that at work. Um, because when I they're there, I want them all in. I want them all in and I want to focus on that. So I think, you know, I'd love to hear from anybody who's in the kind of nonprofit sector who's doing it well, because I haven't fully figured it out when you have, I can't tell them to set, send home, but I can have meetings virtually. I've, t- I've, I've moved to that. We don't need to meet. We don't need to meet or I'm flipping them. Here's the information. So trying to help them so that they can do the things that are necessary, but as well. Um, one of the things I'll say that has been helpful in this process is really also focusing on self-care and not in the bubble baths or pampering, which I love, but don't always have the time for, but more specifically looking at what's really adding to um, my emotional wellness, right? And um, moving through the stress cycle, there's a scrape book called Burnout um, by two Connecticut, oh, I'm just going to forget their names, two Connecticut sisters, actually, but they all talk about moving through the stress cycle. So making time to do that in very specific ways so that I can integrate as necessary as a mom for me, my roles as a wife, as a friend, um, as a mother, all those things to do um, to make sure I'm taking care of myself in a way that helps me to be able to take care of others, especially as an educator, especially as that kind of person that does that. So, you know, those are the pieces that have helped me kind of recenter. Um, and then also just to be compassionate, right? That's part of like the wellness and this mindful thing. Compassionate when I don't, we're in like the busy set season of the school year. Once May hits, it's like, boom, concert. It's the busiest time. So I've like blocked out on the calendar because every year it happens, mom's not cooking dinner these two weeks. Like we gonna figure it out because it just, I, I'm, I love to do it, but it just adds when I have more nights, I can't do it. And so being compassionate and figuring out ways ahead of time <laughs> to think about what certain things look like so that I don't feel guilt ugh, or shame, uh, which, you know, for some reason I don't need to, um, but it's that kind of piece for me. So um, looking at self-care, looking as a leader, how do I help model that, but also don't create situations where I'm saying one thing, but then, then doing another. Um, so that's my story. I'm going to turn it over to Miss Annette uh, to share um, where she's coming at this angle of integration, uh, where she's coming from. Hi. Hi. Thanks so much, Joy. I mean, you, Joy and Beth, you guys have like set the stage so well. Um, I think I'm coming from a, a little bit of a different place in that, first of all, I graduated from Trinity in 1996. I was an American studies major in what I consider like probably one of the best times in that department. You know, I had the likes of Professor Miller and Professor Watts, may they rest in peace. Professor Fred File, may, they rest in, may he rest in peace. So we were there at a very interesting time. And I think uh, it really has shaped who I am as a person and, you know, the, the way that I've approached work throughout my lifetime. I mean, you know, the other thing when I, when I sit here and think about that as a 47 year old woman, I entered the workforce at 15, it's a little bit daunting, right? So that's like, let's start there with that cultural context. I had to work because I needed my own money because my parents had, uh, you know, uh, what I consider middle-class jobs, you know, they were able to take care of us and put us through, uh, school and I paid for some part of my private schooling, but you know, then I was in Trinity and in Trinity I needed cash. And so I always worked. Um, and then when I graduated college, I had so much debt. My dreams of becoming a lawyer were like kind of scrapped. And I said, well, you know, I'm just going to get to the workforce. Um, and I didn't know what to do. <laughs> and I thought I wanted to be a buyer. And that was like, no, that's ridiculous. That's a ridiculous amount of data analytics that I don't want to do. So I ended up, I ended up in specialty retail where my first job was at Macy's as an executive trainee in New York City at Herald Square. And then started a long 20 year, 20, almost 20 year career in specialty retail for uh, you know, world-class brands like The Gap and Victoria's Secret. And it's interesting because today I was thinking about how as a young manager, I caused harm to young people 
because that was like the way that we were trained, you know, like if someone called me and said, Annette, I'm not feeling well, I'm not coming to work today. I'd be like, you better take some Advil and get here. You know, <laughs> like we have, we have fo- clothes to fold, you know, I was 23 and like, you know, it's interesting how much of a mindset you internalize, like colonial mindsets, patriarchal mindsets as women and women of color, you know, like I got a little like manager job with keys and I didn't know how to act, you know? So that was the, like the first thing. And then eventually I, you know, climbed the ranks and had no balance whatsoever at Victoria's Secret. I was a single mom. I had a daughter who was like being taken care of by, you know, uh, a friend of mine. And thank God I had that woman to support me and my mom because I had a real hot shot job at Victoria's Secret where they required a lot of my time. And I spent almost 10 years there, but I got laid off just shy of my 10 year anniversary. And what a shock that was because I had really committed to this place. And, you know, I drank all the Victoria's Secret Kool-Aid and uh, really, um, you know, believed in like what I was doing there and felt good because of my salary and my company car and my company credit card and all the amazing fashion shows that I participated in. But then it was all gone overnight, you know, and I was uh, considered a disposable employee because I complained about somebody being discriminatory in a public setting. And so, you know, those, again, lessons you learn about work-life balance, you know, that was something that we were taught as managers, you know, we got to create that for our people, we're going to create it for you, we want to make sure you have work-life balance, but it's really gaslighting because you you feel pressure to be there, you feel pressure when the CEO is walking in at seven o'clock in the morning to be there, even though you have to figure out like 10, 15 steps and hurdles to go through to get to work at that time, um, and to get your kid to school and, you know, all the other things that, that need to happen. So I I got a year off and uh, was really able to have amazing uh, balance because I didn't have to work for the first time in my adult life since I was 15. I did not have to work for eight months and I wore flip flops continuously and spent a lot of time with my daughter and uh, was able to really assess that my life was upside down because of work. My house was a mess. My daughter and I were not spending enough time together. She was so happy that I was there. And I really got to see like, wow, how much stock I put into what I was doing to get paid. So then I was recruited into finance. (laughs) And, you know, again, the, the, the narratives that we tell ourselves about success as black and brown women, wow, I've made it. I'm Monday through Friday, eight to five. I no longer have retail hours. I'm so excited. I'm going to get an office job. Well, I calculated today and I, in the six years that were, that I've been working in finance have been underpaid by $210,000 and that's without interest. Right. And so I uh, fast forward, I got my license, my series 24. I thought I was going to have more work-life balance because of my Monday through Friday. But what I found was that there were all kinds of jokes about me getting in by lunchtime which was really like nine. And my boss, some of my bosses would say, oh, we already had lunch at 9 a.m. Or there were, you know, you, you should be able to do anything you want with your daughter. But I felt like I was asking for permission constantly. And so it was really hard, right? And it's really hard to work in a patriarchal structure, particularly when you're a woman of color. And harder to see other men who do not have the credentials you have being paid more than you are. And then on top of that, not really being able to balance your life out, even though it's eight to five because of the nature of the work. You know, during the pandemic for two years, I had to come sit at my desk every morning. And at 10 o'clock, there was a meeting to make sure we were on video and you could see us at our desks. For two years, a 45-year-old woman had to report to work that way. And so, you know, it's really at this point, you know, when I, when people say great resignation, I think there's a really big missed narrative in that nomenclature, right? And the missed narrative is that of people of color. You know, at the, I think this is a time of our reckoning with how we define work and how we define success. And when I think about work-life integration, in the past, uh, you know, 45 days or whatever it is that I have not been working for my current employer, 
because I'm on a leave of absence. I have never felt more integrated in my life. And I'm actually working on something, you know? I'm working on advocacy for my community. And I have a liberation schedule. And I'm going to share that because I think it's important. From 8 to 12, I work on myself. I make sure my daughter's off to school and maybe I journal. I take my dog out for a really long walk and I do all the things that I might want to do from eight to 12. From 12 to four, I actually work on something. 12 to four. Because really that's how many hours I've generally worked in the past six years. Because the, the work is easy for me who's someone that's intelligent and also underjobbed. Because I'm asking for more responsibility, but I'm asking, I'm being asked to do data entry. So again, <laughs> you can't integrate a life like that. You have to liberate yourself from a structure like that. In my view, right? In my view, to get the integration that I need as a single parent, as a community advocate, as someone who wants to start a new career in a new field, I, I can't get that in a patriarchal system or structure. And so like for me, the challenge is really like, okay, the way that we're going to get work-life integration as black and brown women, and I also think women that are like down with the cause, you know, white women that are like consider themselves allies, is to create uh, organizations and work structures that really work for women. Because what works for women works for everyone. You know, like the, the, I'll say this one last thing, the month before the global pandemic broke out in New York, uh, New York City, a month before I went and spoke to my supervisor's supervisor. I won't say boss, but they're my bosses and I hate that word because boss is also connotations of, you know, slavery and all of that nonsense. Um, so I went into his office and I said, this is not working. So I'm underpaid, the culture here is not great. And that's like, I'm being nice. And so I think that there's some opportunity here for, you know, adjusting our schedules, giving us more autonomy around our schedules, because when people have autonomy, they put more discretionary effort in when they feel like they're being treated like professionals and they have skin in the game and they have the freedom to make decisions about the things that they're working on and how they're going to achieve them. They do more. But some of these institutions are so archaic because they have men sitting in the C-suite that have been there forever, and then they bring their friends on, things don't change because they can't see it from that perspective. So I'm telling this guy this, and he says, there's no, and I said, maybe some people need to get to work from home. Maybe we do a four day work week. Like, let's be really crazy here. You know, I would rather work 10 hours a day and have a day off than, you know, and he was like, I don't think we're going to be ever be able to get to work from home. And a month later, all of us were home. And I just felt so vindicated. And I wasn't, I didn't feel great about a global pandemic, but I felt like, wow, overnight, you were able to send 350,000 people home. It's possible. And I never felt better working, except for that I had to be at my desk at 10 o'clock in the morning to hear the same spiel for two years. So, you know, I'll leave it there. Thank you. <laughs> That's a lot. Thanks, Vivian. <laughs> now you understand why we invited these three women to have this conversation. And it, it, the beauty of it is those different perspectives that we talked about. There's an overlap, we have a connection, we're women of Trinity, um, and yet the path that each of us have taken uh, hasn't exactly been the straightest. And I think that that's really the, the biggest, um, the, the most important conversation that we should be having, even with the current students as they transition to um, alum status is, it's, it's not as cut and dry as we are made to believe. And I, from what I see in this circle of women is that growth of realization and trying not to just simply better ourselves and our family, but thinking about the people around us and trying to set those examples. So I wanna give an opportunity 
to each other. We'll start quickly with Beth. If you have a question for either Joy or Annette or and. Um, well, I mean, a couple things struck me from both of you. I, I think there's actually more commonality and it, it may not be so obvious, but there's, I think, a lot of commonality in our experience. Um, but I, one of the things that struck me um, was because she spoke after me was was when Joy was talking about the importance of a support system and the importance of you both spoke about leading and leading to example. So I thought I thought that was pretty interesting, Annette, when you brought that up as well, and and you, Joy, because I think for twenty something years in the more progressive organizations. They have been trying to focus on work-life integration, not getting it right all the time and not getting it right a lot of the time, but also really encouraging us as women to be open and honest about how we are making it work and not hide the fact that we're leaving early to go to our grad school class or you know, go help a friend who's in trouble or take care of an ailing um, family member or go to our kids' soccer game, whatever, you know, whatever your your personal priority is. I think that's important too. It's not just about working parents, it's about everybody and everybody's personal priority. But um, I think it's pretty interesting that um, we've been asked to role model it. And I will say that when I made a change about that and I, I stopped hiding, to, for lack of a better term, what I was doing and I was more honest about it. I was like, remember I told you I had that really important client meeting on Thursday afternoon? I'm like, yeah, I was meeting my friend who's getting remarried for her dress fitting because she's been through an awful time. I would never tell anybody in the office that's where I was. I'd tell them it's the equivalent of your kid's soccer game. <laughs> and and uh, she may be on the she may be on the call right now, the person I'm talking about, but it, my point is it's nobody's business what your priority is. And it's up to you to, to make that point. But I think when we started being honest and sharing our examples, um, and I think we need to continue to do that. I'm, I'm saying that because I think as women and just as, as workers, not just women, we need to do that for as a, in a leadership role. And, you know, I guess I think that's important. I also think the importance of a support network, you know, it, it does take a community, it does take a network, whether it's in your organization, your family, your friends, to to just make it make the seesaw work. So that wasn't a question. It was really about tying some of the themes together. And just very quickly, uh, our audience reminding you to please use the Q and A if you have any specific questions uh, for our panelists. I mean, there is, uh, there is one thing that I wanna go back on what Beth said. I mean, I'd even take it further and say, you know, what I would say to young women, and I think they're actually really good at doing this. You know, I know my, I have a daughter, Valentina, who's 12, and she's, you know, like the most badass feminist I know. Like she already has her boundaries and she already questions. And I think, that that's what I would be steadfast about if I, you know, could speak to my like 23 year old self is to really question things and be curious and, and hold people to account. Like long gone are the days of like, you know, uh, you know, we're, we're reporting into this man and they're going to make all the decisions. We're, I mean, we're, we're, we're getting paid for our work and our work is like what Joyce said, it's part of who we are. You know, like our intellectual property is who we are. Um, and so like, you know, I think about all the work that I've done for free in corporate America, like DE and I work where I've helped, you know, even my supervisors overcome their all lives matters beliefs, you know, like that stuff is taxing and it should be, we should be paid for stuff like that, you know? And like, that would be amazing work-life integration because then I'm doing work that is that matters to me that I'm passionate about, but I'm also making your organization that much better, exponentially better, because this guy has people that, you know, 80 plus people that report into him. And I just changed his thinking about his own bias. You know, like that's that's big work that consultants get paid a lot of money out there for, but organizations, you know, are using their people of color to do this kind of work for free, you know, like and 
th that leads to that that speaks back to integration because that makes for very angry people that resign and leave and like you know decide to do other things and that costs cu clients too like think about the customer experience that you get from a company that's not 100 percent joy do you want to add to that yeah i think the piece about um and maybe this is where it's good where we are right now is that people are asking questions, right? And so people are saying, can't we do this better? Um, there was a panelist, uh, someone said that, you know, impossible is a big word. You know, it's the people who you, with younger students say, it means I am possible, um, but it means, yeah, all of these things, these ideas are possible. Um, and, 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 and anything that we've learned from this um, among the, this global pandemic is that things can shift on a dime. And we're in this, um, I was talking to a coach, she's like, we're in this thawing period, right? That it's allowed a lot of stuff to thaw. And, you know, now it's kind of like, how do we put some new things in place mm -hmm. before the freezing process mm -hmm. happens? Because mm -hmm. it's coming, right? Like yeah. we even see some people pulling back on things that were working and not. And so my, my hope is um, that we can continue to kind of ask the questions to say, but why, why do we have to, you know, my staff is like, but do we really need to meet in person um, for certain things? Like, really? Um, can we host things um, virtually? Can we do this better? And I'm like, yes, we can. I mean, I think about things that we should have been doing 10 years ago, because we did have the technology to do it, and we didn't. And so I think um, it, the question is, how do we ask, continue to ask questions of those who are supervising Annette, what you said about kind of thinking about entrepreneurial work, right? I could never be an entrepreneur. Not because I don't think I, I, it's just not my thing. I need structure and I, I'm not my good own boss. Like I get lost in the sauce. But I think even thinking differently about, could I do this better if I was in charge, right? And if I have the funding, if I have the, if I have the supports, if I have those things, if, if I can commit and uh, drive, um, the, this vision into action in the same way that I did it in a structured environment or a corporation or a nonprofit, right? Then I'm like, kudos. I think it's changing the game of what that looks like. I said this before when we were like meeting about this, I wanted to know from Beth, like, how did you even look at retiring early? I think the process of that is just a beautiful thing because I, you know, usually you're like, oh, when you're seven, you know, the, the government's saying for so social security, what is it, 70 something <laughs> at this rate, depending on the age, how do you consider <laughs> like at that point to go, you know what, I'm going to, as you said, fast track it. I think that's phenomenal for people to go, you, it's something that's doable. And we have actually a couple of um, questions. So the first one is, how do you manage the emotional labor that is expected of women in the workplace in addition to the actual work? I think, I mean, I think that's, that has to be like one of the most frustrating things, you know, like, you know, going into finance, I, I just want you guys to think about how many people call me work mom, you know, like right there that puts like, a burden on you, right? And and honestly, like I'm a compassionate person. I'm empathetic. I'm like, you know, I feel people's pain. So I take on a lot of energy that does not belong to me. And I, I would do that at work because for me, like leadership has always been about, you know, helping pe helping folks get to where they want to go, right? Like the first opportunity that I had to hire someone in my finance gig, I hired a, a Dominican lesbian woman who came here at 16 years old and her first job was in a 99 cent store you know like that's how I integrate my life into into what I do right um get on to put on I'm gonna like bring people on that look like me because that'll strengthen the organization um so it's yeah I would take that role on but they also knew when I said no it meant no like no I'm not doing that like, and here's why I'm not doing that. Or, you know what, I'm not organizing this event because I organized the last event and now one of my male peers should organize this event because I'm not like Julie from the love boat. Like somebody needs to, and I'm really dating myself with that reference. Somebody else needs to take on 
uh, some responsibility here, you know, moonlight and hostessing <laughs> and hosting, you know, and ordering buffalo wings and pizza for the office. <laughs> push back, push back and say, we, these are, these should be shared responsibilities. We all work here. Exactly. You know? So the other question is, how do you recommend handling supervisors or colleagues who aren't used to a woman setting boundaries and asking for her worth and saying no to taking everything on? So I feel like Annette touched a little bit on that in, in just her way, but what do you think, Beth? Yeah, I'll, I'll take that. Um... I think that the current environment, I'm calling it a worker's paradigm shift, gives you permission to do things that in so many organizations you could have never done. And so I think be brave, but be smart in how you go about it. Understand your culture. You know, be, I think where people make mistakes is they get bold and they get courageous and then they they act in a way that is, is um, offensive in their culture or, or, and I'm not saying you have to go completely along with your culture, but I'm just saying be astute about your culture and how you should approach that conversation, but be brave about having that conversation. And it, it shouldn't matter whether you're, you're, it shouldn't matter what your gender is. Um, and know that it's a worker's market at the moment too. Like it is hard to find people. It doesn't matter what the job is. It is really hard workers are in control <laughs> and that gives you probably a little more edge than you would normally and you have to ask yourself if you don't do it how are you going to feel not doing it and i think the thing you know supervisors i agree it's a different role and you have to navigate that um but colleagues you know who don't have kind of you just got like the thing with we have to do as women is continue to remind ourselves that we don't have to fit in the box that other people put us in. And that's okay. You know, a colleague is like, yeah, well, I'm going to do what I'm going to do. Their opinion really shouldn't matter. And so I think it's really important too, to say to, to, to Beth's point about, you know, smart with your supervisors, right? Clear as kind with your colleagues to say, I have some things that I have to do. You know, Brene Brown says that clear as kind, and it's true. But set those clarities because sometimes I find colleagues sometimes impact us even more than our supervisors. And we and we put things on the on the leadership culture that aren't even there. It's our colleagues that are setting this stage where we're like, excuse me. And when you talk to the leader, they're like, I never asked you that. I never was expectation. So, you know, and leadership should be aware of it. Right. To fix that kind of culture and identify that. But sometimes it is our colleagues, and I think we can be clearer with our colleagues and also as women just go, it's, it's okay and be comfortable saying no thank you. Um, and, uh, and, and not worry about uh, somehow or another how you're going to be always perceived. Be clear, but be kind, right? Um, but also give yourself the permission to do that and not feel badly about it. And, and, and don't be afraid to take notes and you know, sometimes we have to slow down to speed up, right? So if you take some notes, maybe have a conversation with a mentor or a friend and really like debrief situations, you know, I, I think we shouldn't be afraid to pick up the phone and like call another woman and say, what do you think about this? You know, mm -hmm. I think, uh, I, shout out to like my friend, Tanya Jones, who's in New York. And like, I pick up the phone and we'll be like, what do you think about this? <laughs> am I being like crazy about this one? Like, am I, you know, but um, I think it's important to take a minute to think about things. And then when you realize that maybe there's an issue, like hold those people accountable. And like you said, clear is kind, transparent communication and the way that you articulate yourself is important. Being thoughtful with your words are, is important. Just the way you want a, a, a supervisor or you know so, someone to, to be clear with you, it's it's our um, in our best interest to do the same, right? And to be precise in our communication. And you know there have been many times in my career when I've been emotional, and I wish I had taken like an additional beat, right? Take an additional beat so that I didn't react and I was more like. Uh, 
thoughtful about what decision I was making or what I was going to say. I think that's invaluable advice, you know, and take that breath, talk to somebody before you send that email, or before you go in and have that um, discussion. And I, I think you both said it excellently. Um, I mean, the only other thing I would add is if you're in that environment, it's not you, it's the other person. And that should empower you to have, um, I love the clear is kind, you know, people like to know where they, well, most people are, respect more and are much more comfortable if they know where they stand, good or bad. So I do like the concept of clear is kind and you should be empowered to have the conversations, how you have them, you know, make good decisions, but. And I actually think the best cultures are created through communication, right? And having crucial conversations and creating feedback loops, you know? I, the best organization I worked in was Victoria's Secret because of that, because they had a really strong, and I'm not saying it's, it was like this when I left, but I, I, I think I've enjoyed my time the most working with them because they really created big spaces to get on the ground feedback from um, their employees, whether they were managers or, or sales associates. And so that made you part of the process and you felt proud when the results came in. And, you know, so that's really where I learned so much about leadership and really allowing people to be their whole selves at work, you know, and um, helping people to realize how to leverage their strengths and, and work on, you know, the things that they needed to work on. You were doing that through these conversations. So this you know, that's the, I, I wish that's the, that's the piece I wish for every woman is that we don't silently suffer. If, if we all stop silently suffering, we would create larger spaces for our voices. You know, I, like this notion of permission, I've never asked for permission to speak my mind ever because I just can't. <laughs> And it's not, and when in that permission for us as women, to me, for her to say is not for other people, but to give ourselves that. Yeah, yeah, no. We, but we silence ourselves so yeah. much, and I'll say that. Do you? It just reminded me of something about us suffering in silence, and because there's seasons. I mean, we have a long working life, right? And there's going to be seasons where, like, you're on it, and like you are at the top of your game, and then something personally is going to happen. I, I recall a couple of years right before the pandemic, um, my grandmother was declining, right? And so I'm trying to manage how do you take care of her, but run a school and do, you know, all the roles that we have. And, you, you know, you sit there, you go, I'm not doing anything well. I feel like I'm, I'm maintaining. And there was a point when I'm like, I need to take some time off. I have to deal with this piece. I want to be the granddaughter that I want to be, right? That I am. And I have to do this. And I remember so many people saying two things. One, we didn't notice anything different, right? We feel like you were still holding it together. Okay, right? But we know ourselves. And two, the number of people, and a lot of them women who said, thank you. Like, I didn't know we could take time. And it was like a month or whatever it was, but I, I just, I had to do it to like manage the things that were necessary. And so that's the piece too, is that, you know, we kind of suffer and we don't know how people manage things. And sometimes they're not managing it um, or they don't know that there are ways that they can be given some respite so that they can focus on an area of life that's in crisis at the moment. And so um, I think that's the piece too of even sharing those pieces that you don't have to be at the top all the time. You gotta be competent, right? We gotta be competent, but excellence kind of flows with what's going on around us. And that's okay too, you know, to be compassionate with ourselves. Actually, I would, I put a plug for Brene Brown's, um, uh, what is it? it Come to the heart? No, the, the gifts of imperfection, where she talks about, you know, being compassionate and there is no such thing as perfection. You know, it's, it's doing your, your best. And that's something that I've been trying to put into practice. Uh, you have all given us uh, some gems and I wanted to add a couple of things before we start um, saying our final words. One is if there is anyone in the audience that 
has decided to stay home, the same thing applies in your home. Mm -hmm. Setting the boundaries, uh, clear communication. Your, your children can be your employers or your employees, depending on <laughs> who's enabling. So, and as well as your spouse and a partner, whoever that you might live with. Not all of us have the luxury of a support system. So creating those boundaries to be able to balance yourself in your responsibilities at home is just as important and is part of work-life integration because what we do in the home is work. Um, we all have certain responsibilities. So that's something I want to make sure that we acknowledge um, among our uh, friends that have joined us because I know I was at a point where I didn't feel like I had anything to offer. I'm just at home taking care of the kids. <laughs> That's a full-time job, you know? So all of those things. The second thing uh, is talking about thank you, but also working on not apologizing. I have been extremely intentional for the last couple of years and Melissa's in the background, probably nodding her head because I have kind of called her on it on the same thing of there are different ways of wording things without needing to say, I'm sorry. It could be a thank you or I appreciate or anything else. But before you send out a message or before you say, send, uh, put it out there of I'm sorry, Think about how else you can word it so that you're acknowledging your boundary and your reality, as well as uh, consideration of the other person. So I, I feel like that's something that we need to add. Unfortunately, we only have three minutes left. So I challenge my wonderful ladies to give just one last nugget that you want our audience to um, reflect on? Can you give me 30 second bit? All right, I'll, I'll go since I went first. Um, there's an analogy about work-life balance of a seesaw. And when is a seesaw ever perfectly in balance? Not very often and life life is messy. <laughs> Integrating work and life is messy and um, it ebbs and it flows. And uh, there are times, um, I think Joy used the word seasons, where there are seasons where you have to be intense or some people use the term lean in. And other times when you have to give up projects, give up jobs, give up opportunities because your personal priorities are more important. So don't, my advice, my little nugget is don't strive for perfection, which some of you said before, know that it's messy, know that they're going to be trade-offs, understand your priorities. This is what I would tell my 25-year-old self, understand your priorities and protect them and know how to make decisions around those trade-offs. And you will be much happier, much more satisfied, and I think able to bring your full self to home and to work. It's my nugget. Thank you, Beth. Joy? gosh, you just like gave the amazing nugget. I, I don't, I, you know, all, all I'm going to say is um, this piece of really think about how you are aware. Um, you know, I know there's a lot that's been talking about mindfulness and awareness. And I, and I, and I, I just want to think that's the piece. Sometimes when we are not, it's so loud. If we can find ways to kind of quiet the noise so that we can be aware and know and do I need to set a boundary? Is that what kind of conversation do I need to have? But making time and space just to be attuned to what am I feeling at this moment so that I can make the necessary choices and changes is important. And I think as, and I do think as women, I know everyone is, but I think as women, we are so busy sometimes doing all of the things that we need to do that we don't take the time Annette, I mean, you may not have four hours like Annette does, right, to really kind of have a liberation schedule, but don't mistake that you can't have a, some liberation moments, yeah. right, and that there are some pieces where we can just kind of stop and reflect 
um, so that we can be better to stand up for ourselves um, in a way that helps us to be better at um, integrating all the pieces of, of our lives. That's what I'll say. I, you know, I just want to say one thing. I think like we've got to challenge ourselves to think differently and push ourselves and you know, check where we are ingesting things and what we have ingested and what are our assumptions about work, our assumptions about being women at work. You know, like we were sold an idea that we could have it all and we could do it all. And, you know, like, you know, baby boom, you know, she moves out and she starts like that big, you know, baby food company. No, we should not settle is I think the thing that I would leave you with. And we should also think of this as a, the best time to innovate. You know, one of the things I'm working on now is cannabis. Like this is an exciting time in New York in our history for Latina women, for black women. It's the largest transfer of wealth to black and brown people in our lifetime in this, in this state. So just think about the, the work that you want to do. And that's the best way to integrate your life. <laughs> Like, cause when you want to do the work, when it's joyful work, when you feel like you're bringing light to an organization or your community or whatever it is, that's where you're going to have the best integration. So I'll, I'll leave that with, uh, let's not settle because there's, there's a lot of light ahead of us because we've come out of a really dark, dark place. So thank you. Thanks for having me. I love this conversation. Joy, Beth, you guys are amazing. Yarel, thanks for leading us through this. I appreciate you so much. I appreciate well, Alyssa, every one of you. Thanks for setting us all up. Thank you. And we want to say thank you to our audience for, for their participation um, in the questions asked, as well as just simply the encouragement. Um, Beth, thank you. Joy, thank you. Annette, thank you. Melissa, thank you. Because without Melissa, none of this would happen. She is the person that keeps us organized. She is the person that sends out the schedule that is on top of us in terms of texting, gives me an amazing set of notes to follow, etc. So we want to make sure this is this is work life integration. I mean, in its simplest, and it's the, one of the things that brings me the greatest joy is coming together with all of you and having these types of conversations. So with that, I just want to remind our guests to watch out for the email tomorrow with the post-event survey. Your information, again, is valuable. And what else do you want to see and hear or continue? Um, and also, you've got to put it on your calendar that we've got on May 3rd, that's next week, a conversation with uh, Lisa Casal. I don't know if anyone remembers her, but she's retiring from Trinity from, and you know, she has been what, I believe the director of Hillel House for, for a significant amount of years. And um, so we're gonna be celebrating her tenure. That's May 3rd. May 4th, we're gonna do a, a pseudo Cinco de Mayo Bantam style. And hopefully I will be educating you in terms of what exactly that means. And I'll tell you right now, it is not a Mexican holiday. So we will be talking about that. Hopefully that'll get you to, to join us. And of course, there's going to be some cocktails. So have your ingredients ready. If you register, you'll get the menu so that you have all the things that you could do while we're connected with uh, Kali Irwin. She's our mixologist. So there you go. And then May 17th, we're going to wrap up this uh, Women in Work series. So Joy, Annette, and Beth will uh, be joining us again, along with Michelle Saunders and um, Lisa Iannone, Monica Nova Measley, and Monica, I apologize if I got your last name incorrect, but um, I really hope that you will join us to finish it up. And hopefully you'll have questions for all of them as we see in all the series. So please, if you didn't see it, uh, please go to the Trinity website and um, watch the other series and see how they mesh together and what questions and where we are 
And maybe you can tell myself and Melissa, what other conversation should we be having? Or maybe another style of conversation, because it doesn't end right here. You know, everyone has given us nuggets, but there's still so much that a lot of us could use. And a lot of it is mentorship and support. So with all that, thank you and have a wonderful evening.